UFC 255 is in the books and delivered an incredible night of action from the apex Las Vegas, culminating in two dominant displays in the flyweight divisions. As Valentina Shevchenko outclasses Jennifer Meyer over five rounds to retain her flyweight championship, and Davison Figueredo continues his reign at 125 pounds, defeating Alex Perez in the very first round. Welcome to BT Sport Open Map. This is your official review of UFC 255. I'm Adam Catterall. It's a pleasure once again to be in your company. Joining me as ever, Nick Pete, who might get a little bit of a bashing on this show, seeing as that he tipped Alex Perez to uh, become a new uh, flyweight world champion. And the main man, Dan Hardy. Gents, how are we? We well? Great night of fight from Las Vegas. And I'll tell you something, the king and queen of the flyweight divisions are still on their throne, Dan. Yeah, absolutely. You know, exactly what we expected, really. You know, anybody with a with a sensible bet in mind would have gone in those directions. I mean, you know, Valentina Shevchenko, what was surprising was that she had a rough round. You know, that that's going to give uh, a lot of encouragement to the other fights in the division. Um, but Davidson Figueredo is just a killer, isn't he? I mean, he's, he's such a dangerous individual in every range of the fight. And you could see that on Alex Perez's posture as soon as the fight started. He he knew that he was, uh, he was in for a rough night, regardless of how the fight went. Uh, brilliant fights, really enjoyed them both. No, absolutely. absolutely, And a fantastic main card and some prelim action as well for us to get stuck into. But we'll concentrate on that main event to start. The champ, Davison Figueredo, getting the job done in the first round via guillotine submission on Alex Perez. And the thing that struck me first and foremost, Dan, is how big Davison Figueredo is. This guy could compete at lightweight. He's absolutely massive. He is, yeah. You know, we were talking about it the other day, you know, his move up to bantamweight wouldn't be, a, you know, a, a huge ask for him. You know, he'd probably look pretty normal in that division, especially against, the, you know, some of the other smaller guys that could cut down to uh, to flyweight. He, he's a he's a powerful individual, isn't he? And, you, you know, the thing is with that with that muscle mass that he's got, you know, it's, it's well, t well utilized in the fights. It's clearly, you know, very explosive muscle tissue. It's clearly got, you know, real power in a squeeze as well when he, when he gets clamped onto somebody. I mean, you know, to catch somebody who's so good at neck attacks like Alex Perez with a guillotine, mm. you know, as, as quick as he did. And, you know, there were even moments where it looked like his head was starting to slide out of it. Like you could start to begin to see the crown of his head almost pop, popping through. But no, I mean, that squeeze was was incredible. So he's a he's a very scary, well-conditioned athlete and definitely someone that we could look at maybe being a champ champ in the future. Nick, he's incredibly well-rounded as well, because I know that he obviously gets the victory in this particular fight with a first round guillotine submission. But when them leg kicks land to the body of Alex Perez, I'll tell you something, I could still hear him with my TV on mute, mate. They were absolutely thunderous. Yeah, he's just so powerful, isn't he? And it raises so many questions about, you know, how long will his reign go on? You know, can he absolutely wipe the floor with this whole weight division? And what will that ultimately lead to? Will it lead to, you know, to Udo coming back? Will it lead to potentially, you know, the UFC making a, a bold move and bringing Demetrius Johnson back as well? Chatted about both former champions was alive on social media last night, early hours this morning while the fight was progressing. And, and that's where people are putting him straight away. And you can see why he is just utterly dominant. And I've got to be honest, I'm watching it. And obviously, I've tipped Perez, so I want Perez to have his moment. But even when he, even when Perez raised that single leg and he was lifting the leg up, he was looking for the trip. Straight away, Figueredo rolls into that heel hook attempt and Perez defends it, almost takes his back. But then he just gets turned over, slips straight into that choke, into that front guillotine. And once that was cinched in, you know, the writing was just on the wall and he just looks so powerful. And, he, and, and right now he's fighting like a guy who is believing his own hype and rightfully so. You know, he's utterly mm. dominant. He's confident in every department. At no point last night, even when Perez was getting him in certain situations, did Figueredo look concerned at all. He was happy to be anywhere. It was like he knew what the script was. He knew he could win the fight in every single department. And as Dan just touched on then, that finished. Jeez. I finished. I bet Perez has still got a headache this morning. <laughs> Listen, I like the guy because he's an absolute savage. And I've mentioned this on previous shows before about Israel Adesanya, the champ calling out challenges. We don't normally see that. Figueredo gets the microphone in his face at the end of the fight. And we're going to obviously talk about Garbrandt and we'll talk about Cejudo hitting social media after the fight, Dan. But he made his mark straight away. He pointed to the guy that was at the top of the prelims. He says, all right, uh, Moreno, you've had a wonderful performance. Let's rock and roll. And I love that gangster attitude from the champ. 
Yeah, agreed. You know, it's the fight to make. Absolutely. I, I also like the fact that uh, that that uh, Brandon was passed over for the opportunity to fight for the title because mm. you know it, it's clearly irked him a little bit. You know, he's he's annoyed that he didn't get the call up, but at the same time, that's going to transfer into a really good training camp where he's fully prepared for Figueredo, and now he's got you know a, another fight to to research from, albeit a quite a short one. Um, but but he, you know he's he's going to be able to prepare for Figueredo a bit more, and also be, you know knowing full well that he's deserving uh, of a shot. And his performance was amazing as well. And, and I tell you what, you know, I mean Brandon Royville, we, you know, we, we still can't count this kid out. He's still on the rise, even though he ran into a very tough Brandon Moreno, who's you know clearly the number one contender. But I, I wouldn't mind seeing Royville against Alex Perez next. I think that'd be a fascinating fight. Yep. But the, yeah. the finish from uh, from Moreno was very impressive, and something that stuck out in my mind as well. Because I've watched the fight a couple of times and Joe Rogan on commentary was talking about, you know, oh, well, there's a twister there if he knows it. I, I think he clearly knows the twister and I think he stuck to that rear naked choke knowing full well that it was a it was a higher percentage move. So although although sometimes he may, may look a little reckless in his in, in his approach, I think there's, you know, quite a high fight IQ in there as well. Um, mm. So I think he's quite easily underestimated and I think he might be a, an interesting one to watch in this next uh, next fight with, with Figueredo, you know. Got good momentum, both of these guys. The turnaround's very quick as well. I, I'm, I'm excited to see it, and I think he's a real interesting challenge for Figueredo. Nick, Dan's just mentioned the turnaround there because we're led to believe, if the rumours are true, that these guys are going to turn this round for UFC 256. Figueredo versus Moreno. That's 21 days. Sensational turnaround if they can get that done. Absolutely unreal. Unheard of in the UFC for a champion to defend his belt and turn it around in exactly the next pay-per-view, you know, within a, a couple of weeks. And I tell you what, after the year he's had, we know he missed way for the first fight with Benavidez. But if he was to turn around and beat Moreno as well, I think Figueredo goes from being probably the number one candidate for fighter of the year 2020 to absolutely running away with it. You know, there'd be absolutely no argument whatsoever that this year has belonged to Davis and Figueredo. So brilliant turnaround, fantastic stuff. Hopefully the rumours aren't true that it's going to replace the current main event, Petr Jan mm. and Aldo. Apparently there's some rumours that may have fallen off, which may be the reason why this has been made so quickly. But either way, lovely to see it turn around and fantastic for both these guys, especially Moreno, who will be more than aggrieved and shown it last night, why he was aggrieved that he was overlooked in the first place for this opportunity. Mm. Those noises are coming out of Russia. Petr Jan and Aljamain Sterling is supposed to be the main event at UFC 256. Not confirmed by the UFC or either fighter at the moment, but the noises are coming out of Russia that that fight is off. Keep on top of the BT Sport social media channels this week because when we get some information on that, we'll relay that uh, back on to you. Here's one for you, Dan. Just sticking with the flyweights for a second because we saw Cejudo, we saw Garbrandt take it to social media straight after that fight. Did Cody Garbrandt get away with one last night? <laughs> well, you know, it's giving him another look at the champion. I, I, the, the big question for me is what Garbrandt looks like at flyweight. I, yeah. I just, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a muscular, lean individual anyway. I, I mean, he feels very confident that he can make the weight class. I mean, you know, 10 pounds, if you remember what uh, TJ Dillashaw looked like in, in, you know, in comparison to how he does at Bantam weight. I just don't know as, as Garbrandt's, you know, particularly healthy, going to, be, going to be healthy at that weight. If he can deal with the strength and the power of Figueredo, not only in the striking, but also in the grappling range. I mean, you know, we know Garbrandt's got a good takedown offense, but he's still got to deal with the hands of Figueredo. You've still got to pick your poison. Um, I, I think it might be a rough fight for for Co Go uh, Cody Garbrandt. It would it would be much better for him to have welcomed Figueredo into the bantamweight division. But uh, mm -hmm. hey, who, who knows? I mean, who not want to watch that fight? Two guys that have got ridiculous power in their fists, especially for mm. the for the weight in their size. Um, and then, you know, opposing ground games, good takedown offense for Garbrandt, good scrambles, good, uh, you know, I think his, his neck attacks will be developing as well, still being an alpha male. And then, uh, you know, obviously Figueredo, we know how dangerous he is. It, it's, it's an interesting fight for, for the future. I am far more interested in the Moreno fight though. No, absolutely. Um, Nick, just a final one on the flyweights because Cejudo chirped up as well. Triple C, the champ, 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 or whatever he refers to himself as. This now is slowly building to a real super fight. 12 months ago, flyweights, we were being told, it's dead. The division's gone. Cejudo's even moving up. He doesn't even want to be here. But now that Davison Figueredo's doing what he's doing and looking the way that he's looking, in another 12 months from now, that's the fight that we're all going to be thirsty for, isn't it? Cejudo to come back to maybe get his title back against Davison Figueredo. 
Of course. And that's what Sayudo needs to add to his own legacy. You know, he needs to come back and beat a decisive and a strong champion. And, you know, in all the years of, of, of covering UFC and watching MMA, I can't remember a time, even when Demetrius Johnson was at a peak, I can't remember a time when the flyweight champion was the standout fighter in the sport across all weight divisions. But it looks like Davison Figueredo is going to run with, away with that mantle this year, something that Henry Ciudo was never able to do. So Ciudo was not daft. He was watching last night very carefully. He let us all know he was watching last night via mm. social media. We know he's only in quasi-retirement. We know he's going to come back as soon as there is a strong challenger and a lot of money on the table. And Figueredo right now looks like he could be the guy to go on a real run to kind of uni- to, to, to wipe the faces of all these top challengers in this flyweight division. And then, as I say, it won't be about the UFC. It won't be about Ciudo or even Figueredo calling for that fight. It'll be fans all over the world saying, we need to see it. We need to know how good is Davis and Figueredo. Can he beat Henry Ciudo? And that's when the money will be there. And that's when we'll get Triple C back in the octagon. I can't believe I'm looking forward to seeing Triple C come back, to be honest with you. The king of cringe. But that's a fight already. I do want to see it. No, absolutely. That wraps up the main event. Fantastic victory for Davis and Figueredo. And if the rumours are true, he's going to be turning that round again in 21 days against Brendan Moreno, of which we will talk about his fight again in a moment or two. But let's get stuck into the core main event, shall we? Unanimous decision victory for Valentina Shevchenko, the queen of the flyweights, who got the job done against Jennifer Meyer. And you touched upon this in the intro, Dan. There was a little bit of adversity in this for Valentina, wasn't there? That second round some serious ground and pound from Jennifer Meyer. Yeah, and good control. And it was nice to see as well, because obviously, you know, her coming in with the odds at what they were. I mean, you know, I think Valentina, as she got into the octagon, was minus 2,000. It's a mm. ridiculous like, odd, odds line. It was nice to see Jennifer Meyer prove herself as a contender. You know, it's easy for people to be, dis- you know, discounted as soon as they step in there against a champion like Shevchenko. You know, I was thinking about this a little earlier as I was rewatching the fight. You know, she, she's she's been at the top of the hill for so long now that she's she's been able to solidify her position up there and re, you know you know refortify her defenses. She's such a difficult fighter to find a way into her game, and that was really the question for Jennifer Meyer. You know, how does she find a way into Shevchenko's game? You know, does she she can't play on the outside with the striking game because Shevchenko's kicking game is is just too strong. As soon as she moves into boxing range, Shevchenko has got great footwork and she moves herself out and, and counters with punches on the way. As soon as you clinch with her, she's got great throws, as we saw immediately in the first oh. round. Um, and then her ground game has always looked so dominant that you just kind of can't think of, of somebody finding their way in. The one fight that kept coming up in my mind going into this one was the, the Juliana Pena one, who, you know, Pena was able to take her down and control her to an extent on the floor. I just didn't expect Jennifer Meyer to be able to do the same thing. Uh, and and I think that that's going to give her confidence moving forward. I think it makes for some more interesting matchups in the future because now we know that she's, you know, she's got good potential. And we've also seen some vulnerability in, in Valentina's uh, game, which means that, uh, you know, those odds might not be quite as, uh, as, as high next time. And, you know, there might be a bit more of a, an interest around her potentially, uh, you know, losing the title. Hmm. Nick, Valentina's always going to be linked to someone like her and Amanda Nunes for them to go at it once again. It was a sunset. They've given us some fantastic matchups in the past, but at flyweight, the next fight surely is going to be now Jessica Andrade, given what she did last time out on Fight Island. Yeah, I would have thought so. You know, Andrade is the next girl to try and take a shot and, you know, she'll take some hope probably from that second round performance from Jennifer Meyer because there's stuff to work on there. There's openings, there's opportunities in Valentina's game, which maybe people haven't seen before. But I'm going to be honest, in a one way, I was delighted with Maya because she proved me wrong. I thought she was, mm. she, you know, that second round, she was great. She was game for the full five rounds. But I've also... I was quite disappointed in the third round that she never really went for it. You know, she she went back to standing at range. She went back to letting uh, Shevchenko get into a kickboxing match. She never tried to close the distance and capitalize on that wonderful second round that she had. Had she done that, she'd have gone into the championship rounds, potentially 2-1 up and with real momentum in her way and forcing Valentina really to take more chances. But for me, she stood at range in that third round. If you stand off Shevchenko, she's got a simple routine that she does. She waits, she kickboxes at range, she uses a wonderful pedigree in that sport. Then when she lands, she clinches, she trips, she gets you on the floor and she goes to work. It's that four, same four points every time. Land, clinch, trip, 
work. Land, clinch, trip, work. She does it every time in every round. And as soon as your back hits the ground, she lands in either half guard uh, or side control. And she just ra- she just works, works, works. Whether it's pushing for submissions, landing elbows, landing punches. And that's how she utterly dominates fights. For me, I was delighted in the fact that Maya gave me uh, 20, I've got 20 minutes of wonderful stuff from Shevchenko, being a Shevchenko fan. But if I'm a Maya fan for Team Maya, I think they go away a little bit disappointed. Yes, she mm. can take confidence in that second round, but I think she watches it back and goes, oh, why didn't I pull the trigger in the third? Why didn't I just go for it in the third and get, instead of standing off and let Shevchenko dominate the fight the way she does? Dan, if it is uh, Jessica Andraj next for Valentina Shevchenko, what confidence does she take from the performance that she watched over the weekend? And how does she implement her skills to maybe get her hand raised and become the champ? Well, I, I think, you know, Nick's right. She's going to be confident from that second round with, with Jennifer Meyer. You know, the, the, the one thing to bear in mind is that it wasn't a, a Jennifer Meyer takedown that ended her up on the floor. It was a, a failed Valentina Shevchenko takedown. The difference with with Jennifer Meyer and Jessica Andrade is that like Andrade has got a low center of gravity. She's short. She's powerful. She's very good at getting in underneath fighters up against the fence and lifting them up and slamming them down. Mm-hmm. And and the, that's the kind of fighter that's really going to cause Shevchenko problems, especially given the fact that you know if she is taking her down against the fence, she's going to be able to stack her into the fence like we saw Jennifer Meyer do. And she's also got you know big power in her hands as well. She throws a high volume of strikes. She would be doing that on the floor. I, I I think she's a really interesting challenge. I mean the fact that the fact that Jessica Andrade went from bantamweight all the way down to strawweight because the flyweight division didn't exist. It really shows you that. I mean this is really where she's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And I think you know her being able to step in there and and and, uh, and be a very very different type of fighter to anybody else that Shevchenko is going to fight in this division makes me excited to see it. Um, you know, I think, you know, there's a couple of other fighters floating around at the moment. Obviously, Lauren Murphy's doing well. Yeah. Um, and we saw Caitlin Shukagian win, even though obviously she's got the, uh, you know, she's got that loss to, to Jessica Andrade from Fight Island. But, you know, a, a, a matchup with with, uh, with with those two would make a lot of sense for the next contender to come along, Lauren Murphy and, and Shukagian. But the other thing I will say is, Bringing Jessica Andrade into this division also brings in the possibility of of potentially uh, Zhang Wei Li stepping up. Mm. You know, I mean, she she's big for the strawweight division. I would say she's she's more heavily muscled than Joanna, and I think um, if Jessica Andrade does well against Shevchenko, even if she loses the fight, if she does well, Zhang Wei Li is going to feel encouraged to step up and try for a second title as well. So there's a lot to play for in this division at the moment. There's a lot of excitement around it. The fact that we've got such a strong, you know queen piece being uh, being Valentina Shevchenko just makes every single fight more exciting because we're looking for the potential in the contenders and what they could possibly do to beat her. And we saw a little bit of that from Jennifer Meyer this weekend. Dan mentioning Zhang coming to flyweight's got me absolutely buzzed. Stop it, man. It's not Christmas yet. Calm yourself <laughs> down. Let's all calm ourselves down. Uh, that concludes uh, our chat on the co-main event. Fantastic performance. The queen is still on the throne. Valentina Shevchenko getting the job done over five rounds uh, against Jennifer Meyer. Let's move on uh, to the rest of the main card. Mike Perry, Tim Means. Tim Means getting the uh, decision in this fight, Nick. Loads of things to talk about for a fight week for Mike Perry. We obviously on our live show on BT Sport discussed his weight cutting issues and how much he mugged me off in that in that situation. But also, as he's making his way to the octagon, they played the wrong music for the lad. It, it, it couldn't be such an upside down fight week if you tried for a Mike Perry. It was utterly bizarre, but then everything Mike Perry does and everything he's involved with is utterly bizarre, isn't it? So, you know, even when he played the wrong ring music, it was kind of like, well, yeah, I guess this was going to happen as well. Because everything else seemed to go wrong or right, depending on which world you live in. The most frustrating thing about Mike Perry is you watch that fight, especially you watch the first round, and you can see him evolving as a fighter, you know? You can yeah. see him going for takedowns, landing takedowns, going for submissions. You know, that that submission looked close at one point and, you know, I, I suddenly had flashbacks to the weigh-in party where me and Dan were ridiculing you uh, for <laughs> not believing that Mike Perry couldn't make a fool of himself. 
and he looked like he was going to make a fool of us by getting a, a first round rear naked choke submission over Tim Means, which have, would have been phenomenal in the career of Mike Perry to get his first ever submission in the UFC. But listen, Tim, Tim Means is tough as all boots, and he managed to get out of that. And unfortunately, you know, I think that was that was uh, the, the the highlight for Mike Perry. After that, it was it was old school Mike Perry in rounds two and three, tough, mm. bru- bruising, able to walk through crazy punches ends up battered and bruised and bloodied, but, you know, lost the second and third round convincingly. Strangely, was still looking to to get a takedown to maybe kind of recoup what he did in the first round, but he's just so frustrating, you know, and I know he's been to many camps across the US. He's, He's trained with some of the best trainers. He's sparred with some of the best guys. But he still just kind of goes and does his own thing. He ends up, you know, just getting into trouble and, and, and living in Mike Perry land. And I doubt he's ever going to change at this stage, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. But the potential he's got there to grow as a mixed martial artist, the potential he's got to potentially go on a real good run, it's frustrating as a fan because you can see it there. He's got the one thing that a lot of guys haven't got. He's not afraid to be punched in the face. He's not afraid to go to the well. But if you haven't got the technical acumen and you haven't got the ring IQ to go with it, your career's just never going to last long and you're always going to be a win-loss fighter. Or a corner, or a nutritionist. Yeah. No, I, haven't, I haven't finished on that yet, Mike Perry. Uh, but Dan, we haven't to overlook Tim Means. I know it's very easy when Mike Perry's involved in a fight. That's the whole narrative of everything. But Tim Means, all the things on the circus that comes with fighting Mike Perry, as we saw throughout the course of the week, and when you lose the first round convincingly, even though I think one judge gave it to Tim Means, which I thought was absolutely bizarre, he, may, he kept his composure, kept himself in the fight, and run away with it in the second and third rounds. Yeah, he did. You know, he's a veteran. His Tim means he's been doing this a long time. I, I, I can't remember what uh, I can't remember what it was that uh, that they they the stat they pulled upon commentary, but it was like he made his debut on Fuel TV, which doesn't even exist anymore. You know what I mean? It was like he's been around for a while. He, he's he's got a very diverse game. He's a very dangerous individual at every range. And, you know, the thing is with Mike Perry, you kind of don't know what to expect from him. And, and that's that's always a challenge for someone like Tim Means, who deals better with someone that's familiar to him, someone that's got, you know, 30 fights and, and they've been around for a while and, and Tim Means can kind of really look into their game and see what he can expose. Um, with Mike Perry, you just kind of don't know what you're going to get. And, and Nick's mm. absolutely right. You know, the potential that Mike Perry's got is what always keeps that question in fighters' minds when he steps in there. You know, you, you although you although a lot of fighters, you know, you look at him and you kind of think, well, maybe they're not taking him as seriously as they should. The, the reality is that they do because they know he's got heavy hands, yeah. and it's easy to underestimate the rest of his game because he is a bit of a crazy person. But that you know that back take and the rear naked choke threat, you know, it shows that again there's potential in in other ranges of uh, of Mike Perry's game. So yeah, we we can't uh, yeah we can't discount the the fact that uh, Tim Means had a great performance and and I you know I think he could be a, a problem for anybody in this division you know mm. uh, he's just the size the range the style that he's got the experience that he has um, I, I I think it was a good performance for him and and I think he'll be disappointed with himself that he didn't get the finish but you know it's Mike Perry you know we, we all love him he's a bit of a train wreck <laughs> but he's he's a fascinating train wreck he kind of reminds me of the second coming of Phil Baroni. You know, yeah. like a guy, another guy that had loads of potential, heavy hands and, and uh, all the character in the world, but just couldn't quite, you know, get all the pieces in the, in the right places before it was too late. Hmm. Uh, also on the main card, a unanimous decision victory for Caitlin Chukagian, who was the betting underdog coming into this fight against Cynthia Cavillo. We all saw Chukagian six weeks ago get beat off Andrade. Obviously, that maybe played some type of factor with the bookies, but she got the job done uh, over 15 minutes. And Dan, yeah, we've got to pay, obviously, fantastic kudos for, to Caitlin for getting the job done, but I was a little bit underwhelmed with Cynthia Cavillo. I thought that she played right into Caitlin's hands. She didn't really grapple with her and play to her own strength. She decided to stand up and fight her, which is which is what Caitlin's all about. You know, I, I think it's because we, you know, she knows how dangerous Caitlin Jukagian is. You know, she's she's excellent on the ground. She, you know, she's a brown belt Brazilian jiu jitsu under Henzo Gracie. She's got Mark Henry in a corner who she's absolutely tuned into, and all those codes and phrases that he uses for various different combinations. 
Um, she's a talented fighter. She's got good footwork. She's got good striking. And the reality is, it, it was it was less about Cynthia Calvio not looking very good and Caitlin Chikagian looking consistently, you know, impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, we we you know we discounted because we saw her lose to uh, lose to Valentina Shevchenko. You know, she got put in a position she couldn't get out of, and the fight was stopped by TKO. Then you've got the the stoppage against uh, Jessica Andrade again. You know, you could easily underestimate her because of that, but. She's the kind of fighter that if you put her in there ten times out of ten, she'll you know she'll win seven or eight of them against everybody in the division, mm-hmm. because she's she's consistently good. You know she's educated in the way that she moves. And Cynthia Calvillo, she's a bit she's a bit rough around the edges. You know she makes up for a lot with aggression and tenacity. And as soon as you're able to shut that down with a good jab and some footwork and some movement. You know, the bottom falls out of it sometimes, and that's what happened with Calvillo. She she couldn't find a way in, you know, which is what you expect to see with people, you know, uh, up against uh, the champion Valentina Shevchenko. She's got a very similar game. She manages the pace and the range of the fight very well, and she's got the skills in every range to be able to do that. Hmm. Very noisy fight, I thought. Do you get extra points <laughs> when you shout Kiai? Do you? Do you? Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually had this conversation with Holly Holm because she's known for it as well and she doesn't even know why she does it. She started doing it early on as, so she doesn't hold her breath while she strikes. But, yeah. it, you know, it goes back into the old days of mixed martial arts. The one thing I did laugh at though was uh, uh, John Anik saying when they're going to give us noise-cancelling headphones. That doesn't help. <laughs> it comes through in the programme noise. It's just going to be louder with noise-cancelling headphones. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, kicking off the main card, it was the big Scott himself. It was the rematch. Uh, for Paul Craig against Shogun. And this is something that I didn't necessarily expect. He got the job done um, with Shogun tapping to strikes in that second round. Um, Nick, there's something there's something upsetting to see a legend like Shogun tapping to strikes in an empty arena, which could be actually his last effort in the UFC. Yeah, heartbreaking from a from a hardcore fan perspective, but from a British fan perspective, I was mm. absolutely over the moon for Paul Craig. You know, I think it was absolutely wonderful that he finally got the, got his rever- got you know that that fight back after the the draw, the controversial draw over in Brazil. Listen, it, obviously it's hard looking at Shogun and looking at where he is now, but he's also he's an absolute veteran. You know, he's he's been there and done it, and he's made many a man quit from strikes himself in the past. And if you stick around long enough, these things come round in circles. And I just think it was a bit of a passing of the torch. It was an absolute icon, an absolute legend, the Hall of Famer in Shogun, the former champion, just showing his age a little bit. You know, if you look back on his record, yes, he's on a magnificent run at the moment. Prior to this fight, you know, he was he lost one in the last six, but two of those fights were against Little Nog. Uh, most of the other wins came against guys who were, who were just strikers that stood in front of Shogun and tried to have it out with him. Um, and Paul Craig just wasn't going to do that this time around. That was the best thing about it for me. Mm. Paul Craig approached this fight completely differently. I remember Sao Paulo. I remember Paul Craig being down there. And I remember him saying, I feel like a kid at Christmas. I'm fighting Shogun. That is absolutely the wrong attitude against anyone. This was completely different. He was in that octagon snarling. He was like a predator. He couldn't wait for Shogun to get in there. He didn't take his eyes off Shogun. He was looking at Shogun like a bit of old mature meat that he was going to savage and rip apart old Beardew. And that's exactly what he did from start to finish. He fought to his own strengths. He dominated the fight. And he did the one thing veterans like me hate. Pick us up, put us down, make us work. Don't stand at the end of our punches and we'll end up blowing for tugs. And that's exactly what he did. That's the way to do it. He exhausted Shogun in quick fire time. And then to make him tap to strikes, well, I'll tell you what, that is Paul Craig's, that truly was Paul Craig's Christmas coming early. He just got a, he was a year ahead of himself. That's all. Look at this, the king of the Paul Craig fan club, Nick P, on the train, choo-choo, all steam ahead. No doubt, top 10 fights coming his way uh, in the light heavyweight division. But Dan, just a quick one on Shogun. He has been a legend of the sport, but a very disappointing way to go out. Yeah, you know, and, and I think I, I think a lot was said in that tap as well. I, I, you know, you look at Shogun and you know the kind of fighter that he is, and he's not a tap-to-strikes kind of fighter. You know, you wouldn't have got that uh, from Shogun, you know, two, three, four years ago. Mm. I think he's, I think he hit his limit. And I think he realized that in the fight, you know, he's fighting a younger, stronger, taller, you know, talented individual that was beating him at every range. You know, I mean, 
for me, Paul uh, Paul Craig looked like the version that we see at the face offs. You know, when he's got yeah. the he's got he's got the Braveheart face paint on and he's getting in people's faces. Like that version of him seems to not step into the octagon most of the time. But for the first time, I felt like he looked really good. And I think the confidence, the movement, the 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 the, the kicks as well. I, I think lots of things just kind of slowly broke Shogun down. And he looked mm. so dejected at the end of the fight. I was very surprised he, he didn't go for the tape on his gloves. Because that that was that wasn't for me, that wasn't Shogun tapping to strikes in that fight. That was Shogun tapping out on his MMA career. I just I just think he looked worn out. You know, and I think we all re- realistically we all know that. I mean, Shogun was going from first gear to fifth gear. You know, in his early twenties, in his pride fights, like he was a wild man, and he he rode the wheels off the uh, off the hot rod that is his uh, is his body. I mean, yeah. he he absolutely thrashed it all the way through those years, and mm. I would imagine that you know, even though right now he's he's not like age wise you know, as old as some of the other guys in the division. I mean, you look at Glover Teixeira, it just makes what he's doing even more impressive. For me, I look at Shogun every time I, every time he steps in there and I just think to myself, you know, we, we've we've already seen the best of him now. You know, he's fading. It, it's, you know, a title run is not, not in his future. And I think, you know, we were counting down the days till we saw him step out of there. And that mm. tap into strikes, I think, signifies him just kind of, just kind of calling it a day. I would be surprised if we see him fight again. Wow. Uh, let's get stuck into the prelims. Now, the, the headline of the prelims, we kind of touched upon it slightly when we were talking about uh, the main event because it was two flyweights going at it. Moreno versus Roy Val. The boys had picked this out for a potential fight of the night. And we kind of knew that the winner of this would be the next in line for a shot at the title. Well, it was Moreno that came through. One second remaining of that first round and the referee stopped the contest. TKO victory from Reno over Roy Val. Bit of a shoulder injury, ground and pound work there uh, from him, Dan. A sensational performance, a sensational victory, and he moves on now into a title shot. But just explain the situation there with Roy Val and that shoulder injury. And he did look in an awful amount of pain, the young man. Yeah, he did, absolutely. I I don't think it was a new injury, to be honest. I mean, it looked... It, it looked like he knew exactly what had happened and he was trying to guard it. I mean, there was there was nothing he could do in that in that end sequence. You know, the referee gave him every opportunity, but I don't think Goddard could quite tell. Was it Goddard referee? I think it was. Yes. The referee couldn't quite tell that his that his shoulder was was dislocated. Mm. He was definitely holding on to something. But as soon as the fight was called, I actually thought he'd fractured his wrist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, it's difficult in the moment to see what's going on. But obviously with seconds counting down, you, you kind of want a fighter to be able to get to the end of the round if they're not taking concussive blows. And and they weren't, you know, I mean, Moreno was controlling his posture, partly because he couldn't really move a great deal anyway. And, and he was just, you know, hammering down, you know, short range punches. It was more of a flurry to, to finish than anything. It, you know, he wasn't getting necessarily hurt with those strikes. The the arm was just, was was, was the, the the main issue. And the reality is, you know, obviously we all saw, uh, we, we all saw his coach, uh, Mark Montoya put it back into socket pretty quickly oh. right afterwards. Um, th- there was no continuing on from that. You know, if, if it popped out like that, that needs dealing with immediately. It needs immobilizing straight away. Otherwise, it's a recurring injury. You know, yeah. I, every time I see that, I always think back to the Danny Williams fight. You remember when he dislocated his arm and yeah. still won the fight? And it was just hanging Potter. at his waist. Like, yeah. you know, the, the, the more times that an arm dislocates, the less likely it is to stay in the socket. So mm. what he needs now is to, you know, get, get that healed up and safe. Because we'll see him in a title shot in the future. But mm. Moreno looked excellent. You know, he was dominant throughout. The, the, the chain of submission attacks as well was beautiful. Um, really, really good performance. I, I was expecting fight of the night, but I think we got performance of the night instead. No, fantastic uh, from Moreno. And as we're hearing, 21 days, he'll be fighting for UFC gold. Right, Nicholas, here you go. This is where you can take all your plaudits uh, because we're going to get stuck into uh, a couple of the fight of the nights and performance of the nights bonuses. And Joaquin Buckley's there again, mate. He's earned himself an awful amount of money over the last couple of months, hasn't he? Uh, fantastic victory over Jordan Wright, but... You boys did point this out. Nick, it was a padded record. He looked well out of his depth, didn't he, Jordan Wright? He did, you know, and I think I think the first round for me, Wack and Buckley was just loading up a little bit too much. He got a little bit caught in the moment and uh, caught up in the hype and was looking for it, and that kind of gave Jordan Wright a little bit of a stay of execution. But in that second round, that finish just completely lit him up. You know, right hand, left hook, boom. He's got serious power, Buckley, you know, and... You just want to see him fight again and again and again because this guy will just continue 
to putting people to sleep. And it was nice for me to get at least one of my predictions right on the night. I didn't do too well on the main card, but certainly Wacky and Buckley, he was there to support me. And another highlight reel finish for him, as you say, another bonus check for him. He's already talking about, you know, potentially fighting Kraus, and it's looking like he wants January 23rd, like everybody else, he wants to be on the Connor bill. So we could get a chance to see him up close and personal on Fight Island. I would love to see that power land in Abu Dhabi. But, you know, a few people have broke through in 2020 the way Wacky and Buckley has, you know, yet again. Another highlight reel finish. This guy's rapidly becoming a fan favourite all over the world. Yeah, he got the job done in the second round at CKR of uh, of right. Fantastic win for Joaquin Buckley. But just a quick one on him, Dan. In the post-fight interview, Nick just touched upon it there. He was reluctant to say the name, wasn't he? Just a little <laughs> bit reluctant to say the name. But you can bet your bottom dollar, as, as we've seen on social media, James Krause was watching and he got all over the uh, all over the social media and hit the tweet, didn't he? So hopefully that's the fight that we'll get to see next. Yeah, he was fired up. You know, yeah. even Rogan commented on it after the interview. Like he's he, I, I need to I need to catch up on that uh, on that that beef because I'm not exactly sure where, where it stems from. But uh, <laughs> yeah, they they don't like each other. And, and James Krause is uh, he's poking the bear. And you know, the other thing as well is I, I was surprised. You know, we commented on it in the weigh-in show that Buckley weighed in was it 182. You know, mm. he might be he might be moving down to welterweight. I mean, he's he's a strong, powerful individual, but imagine wow. him in a welterweight frame would be deadly. Um, so we'll see. I mean, we know James Krause will fight up a weight class if necessary, but it might be an interesting one to see if Buckley can get down to one seventy and uh, and step into the welterweight division. Uh, that's definitely uh, the fight to make, though. And, and you know, with those two knockouts back to back, you know, he's he's definitely mm. one of the standout fighters of the year. Mm. Uh, the other fight of the night bonus went to Valentina's sister, Antonina Shevchenko, getting the job done against Ariana Lipsky. Second round, ground of pound. And Dan, I just want to get your take on the development of Antonina because the last time we saw her, she was dominated in those grappling exchanges. We know that she's brilliant on the feet. I mean, she, her, her Mai Tai pedigree is unreal. But for this particular fight, you can see the development. She initiated the grappling exchanges and she dominated on the deck. I thought it was brilliant from Antonina. Yeah, she, you know, she looked good. You can clearly see that she's she's developing. And, you know, it's, it's clear where she needs to develop because she is a good striker. Although, you know, uh, you know, Lipsky's an excellent striker as well. There, there were a lot of times in the, you know, in the early rounds that it looked like Lipsky was, was going to back her up and hurt her with some of those strikes. Mm. Um, I think it was the smart game plan for, for Antonina to, to take the fight to the floor and to control on the ground. Uh, and, and it was nice to see that development in a game. I still think we're going to see those limitations, though, when she starts climbing the rankings because, you know, where she's at with her ground game, it, it was good enough to beat Lipsky. But if you look further up the division, she's going to really run into some problems with some high-level strikers. You know, it's it's nice to see her get back on the win. It was nice to see both of them get the, get the, the, the win on the night as well, the sisters. Um, mm. I, I just, I, I wonder, I wonder how quickly she can progress. Cause obviously, you know, she's got the Shevchenko name. So a lot of people are going to want to fight her, even though she's not Valentina. It, it's a way to get into the conversation. If you've got a win over her sister, yep. then, you know, there's a story going into a title shot. So mm. I think she's always got a target on her back, even if she's, you know, number 15 in the rankings. Um, so she needs to learn quick. She needs to develop fast because it's almost like she's having to try and keep up with her sister, which, mm. as we know from the main event, is is practically impossible at this point. Nick, she does, though, have a, a premier sparring partner, though, to help her develop, doesn't she? She does, of course she does. You know, and um, for me, she just looks like she's three or four, maybe five years behind Valentina. That's all. You know, Valentina, I remember when Valentina first came into the UFC, she was very much just the striker. She did have holes in her ground game. Um, and she had issues with her grappling as well. But obviously, she's iron nose out now. And it'd be impossible, really, for Antonina to live with her, train with her, spar with her every single day and not improve and not become also one of the best the top 10 flyweights in the world. But Dan's right. She's got the biggest target on her back for everybody outside of the top 15 because it's a surefire way to get into the champion's head if you can get a win over a sister. so But great for them, great for the Shevchenko twin uh, sisters. Amazing afterwards that Valentina revealed that it was her mother that started the celebrations because her mother became Muay Thai shadow boxing world champion that week or something, which sounds amazing. <laughs> that, that's a sport for me, that 
Muay Thai <laughs> shadow boxing champion. I fancy myself at that. Take no shots and just look good on it. Good luck, look good in front of the mirror. That's a bit of me, that. But uh, yeah, it sounds like it's been an amazing week for that family. And, you know, the, the absolutely the, the show rolls forward for the Shevchenko uh, girls into 2021. What a night it was. Two incredible championship performances and a stellar undercard. The UFC delivers once again. Who can beat Valentina Shevchenko? She remains unbeaten at flyweight. And Davidson Figueredo defeats Alex Perez in the very first round to remain champion at 125 pounds. What is next for him? Only time will tell. That's all from us here on BT Sport Open Map. We'll catch you next time.